I can't do it anymore. I can't do it. I don't want to live in this world. The apocalypse I have been mentally nerving myself for is here, but I'm not ready to live it. None of us are. Hi everyone and welcome to this FacingFuture.tv press conference. Thanks for coming this afternoon. My name is Rupert Reed. I'll be the chair of this session. And this session is very important to us because we think it's, well, it's what the whole COP is really about, really. It's about the future. I have with me four remarkable youth activists from around the world. So why do we think this is such an important event as I say, this is the future, and if COP26 doesn't get its act together in a far more fundamental way than it's done so far, there won't be a future. And it's the lives of these people, and people younger than themselves as well, of course, who will be betrayed. And really what the idea of this session is, is to give them a chance to voice their feelings and their thoughts uh, about this. And you're going to hear it straight from the horse's mouth here in a very direct way, and I think you'll, you'll find it one of the most powerful things at this whole COP. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker. Mira Dasgupta is the US Youth Poet Laureate 2020. She is going to give us a poem of her own, which expresses, I think, the kind of thing that I've been starting to talk about in those introductory remarks. Mira. Thank you. This is Lineage. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. A Native American proverb. There is a mother here. Her skin has known the salt of broken oceans. Her hands have traced the sun until it became her. She learned respect from a father and his hands how the bones of dead flowers made their garden a burial ground. Her body was her family's burial ground. Her mouth, an untamed flame. It escaped and left her with a vase. In it, her reflection appeared and shattered. There is a brother here. He has learned to breathe air as dark as his skin. There are no lights in a city of stars that do not reach him. Some days, he feels paperweight. In his dreams, he is flying. He's forgotten the smell of grass and his mother. He's forgotten the sounds of the wind, what it means to fly. In his dreams, he carries a star in his pocket, but it burns from the inside out. It reminds him of himself that there is a burning within him. There is a father here. He overflows into his mother's garden. Her flames lick his stubborn skin as he swallows the ocean whole. He writes odes to himself until his blood becomes a dead rose. And as the sea levels rise, as they run like a crimson mouth psalm, as children curl like wayward leaves, as storms shake their sea blue hands, as these hands overturn burial grounds, as burial grounds become his mother, a father becomes a son in mourning. There is a daughter here. She has been taught how to sustain on seeds, but to never settle for them, to treat the grounds as she treats her body, to till the earth until she too is the sun. When morning arrives, she finds the shattered reflections of her mother and recalls the pieces, countless oceans converging where she stands. You can hear an echo of lineage, the sound of a thousand daughters mothers, sons, and fathers, how they become a garden, how their voices bloom among the scattered bones and carry like seeds to wind. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Mira. Our second speaker is Echem Alberak. Echem is an intern with the Human Impacts Institute and an Extinction Rebellion activist in her native Turkey. She's going to speak with us for a few minutes about what that's like, about what that feels like emotionally and what that feels like politically. And she has a few images to accompany her remarks. Echem. Thank you. I want to share with you something I wrote um, during a very difficult time um, when my country, Turkey, was aflame this summer. Um, and this is my thoughts and feelings. I want to write pages and pages and not say a single word at the same time. Everything feels pointless right now. Honestly, haven't felt this hopeless and stuck in a long time. Selectivism feels pointless. Writing this feels pointless. Being here feels pointless. But I want to let my feelings out just because I need to let them out. I can't do it anymore. I can't do it. It's becoming a recurring thought inside my head. I don't want to live in this world. Sometimes I don't know how to be in this world. How to have a life, how to dream a future. My brain can't dream me reaching old age lately. It's as hazy as the sky that little child was looking at. The apocalypse I have been mentally nerving myself for is here, but I'm not ready to live it. None of us are. With even the limited amount of news and media I allow myself to follow, I get shaken to my core. Record heat waves, historic flooding, massive wildfires, deaths, war, hatred, suffering. It's like a never-ending nightmare. I'm in a constant emotional exhaustion and want to cry and scream. In my head and mind, I don't know how to stay hopeful when the world is collapsing before my eyes at this accelerating pace. I even often feel guilty for not being able to stay hopeful all the time, beat myself up for not being able to take more action, for spending most of my energy trying to stay sane. The wiser voice in me nudges, come on, Ajem, you know despair won't help creating the world you want to live in. It's going to be a long fight, but we can do hard things. Show, it, show up even when you're messy and afraid. That voice and the knowing of my heart can dream brighter, hazeless skies. I know there is a better world our hearts know as possible. One with empathy, healing, safety, understanding, harmony, peace, freedom, and love. Right now, I'm trying hard to listen to that knowing, that little voice inside me I can hear when I sit still instead of the stubborn chatters of my mind. Frankly, it is what keeps me here. And I wonder what would happen if we all started listening better. There's this one quote I can't seem to stop thinking about. There comes a point where we need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. What if we all listen to the voice of our hearts? Stop just pulling people out of the river. Stop trying so hard not to fall in ourselves and went upstream together. What more needs to happen for all of us to start going upstream? This is the question that keeps me awake at night. How can we collectively go to the upstream and make more people open their hearts to the truth and to the pain and the grief? Um, because we need to sit in the grief. We have to be willing to acknowledge the pain, um, the painful truth, because if we don't, if we don't sit in the reality of the issues, we're just going to continue fooling ourselves um, and we don't have time for it anymore. I personally choose to 
channel my grief and despair into action. That's where I find my hope. These are some photos from some of our actions from, with the Extinction Rebellion in Istanbul. Those are specifically from one funeral march we did um, for the species that are going extinct um, because of climate change. The red costume is the Red Rebel Brigades, an artivist troop of Extinction Rebellion, and it symbolizes the common blood that all species share, um, that unifies and makes us one. And it's, it is really powerful to be walking around on the streets wearing it because you can see people connecting with it empathetically and they can understand the message of it. I know what I'm um, inviting you to do is difficult, opening our hearts to the pain and the grief. Um, it's, it's a deep analysis and um, it is painful, but we have to somehow, somehow get, get the strength in ourselves to feel it all. Um, and then we have to find ways to turn it and channel it into action. Um, we first have to feel the pain and then we have to rise. Thank you. Mm. Jim, thank you so much. Thank you for bringing yourself here so honestly to us. And I think I can speak for most people in the room when I say that was hard to listen to. Thank you for giving us something that was hard to listen to, that we need to, we need to listen to and we need to hear. Our third speaker is Luisa Neubauer. Luisa is a leading activist in Fridays for Future Germany. She is going to speak about the crisis of empathy that she believes is consuming the world at this time. And I think it very, follows very beautifully from what HM just said. I noticed HM's words, what would happen if we all started listening better? I think that's the kind of question that motivates Luisa's remarks. Luisa. Um, thank you so much. I grew up in Germany in one of the richest parts of the world. When growing up, I was told I could be anyone. I was told that in a country where even a woman can become a chancellor, the sky is the limit. I was told, travel the world. And so I did. And I would meet people that were exactly my age and that should be able to have exactly the same hopes and dreams as I could. But they couldn't, because in contrast to me, fighting for the climate crisis wasn't a lifestyle decision. It wasn't a political decision. It was a question of survival. Today at this COP, there are more people, more of those young people um, than ever around who can tell them their stories um, so well, and they are, and I ask you all to listen to them. And me? I would travel the world and wonder, when was it that we as human beings lost our sense of true solidarity? I would wonder when it was that people from across continents would stop caring. I wondered when it was that we unleashed this global crisis of empathy. And when was it that we stopped looking each other's into the eyes? When was it then? that love for the world, for children and for future has been replaced with accelerating, digging, profiting, making, burning and extracting. At this COP, there is a big debate going on about the role of the richest nations, those who have caused this crisis, what is it that they have to do? And there's a lot of talk going on about stepping up about accelerating, about all of us being in this together, about moving faster, about stepping up the game. This is not what this is about. This COP, this climate crisis, the question of what is the part of the richest nations, this is about paying back. This is about acknowledging the climate depth we are in, about the suffering that has been caused while being full aware of the consequences for human and animal life everywhere. This is about 
listening to the most affected. And this is about regaining global empathy. Because after all, this is what climate justice is about. It's about daring radical empathy, wherever we are, whatever generation we belong to, no matter our skin color, no matter the continent we grew up on. And this is about repair, gaining global solidarity and relearning what empathy really is about. In Germany right now, the country where I grew up, the new government is formed as we speak. And it could be the first government to prove what 1.5 degree politics would look like in an industrial nation and in a modern large democracy. And I'm being asked a lot whether I'm hopeful that the new government will do this as they debate while we're speaking here. And to me, this is such a weird question since when is this about hope in the government? That hope died 25 cops ago. But I have hope. Hope in the people, in the movements. And more importantly, I have the knowledge and we have the knowledge that change is in fact possible. That it is in fact possible to live and thrive across continents, to regain our empathy. And what we need except that hope, that knowledge is the courage to fight for those changes that we want to see in the world because if it's not us, then this won't happen. And after all, I wonder what should ever stop us. I dream of this world where, where we start looking each other into the eyes. I dream of this world where we are showing real empathy as an act of solidarity, where real empathy isn't an act of resistance, but something that is leading the way. This world is possi possible, this world is necessary, and this is the world we are intending to build. This is not a message to global leaders. This is a message to the people who this is up to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luisa. It's a great privilege to have you here. What a superb panel we have here. We've heard an extraordinary poem. We've heard testimony from Turkey, which has been part of the ring of fire around the Mediterranean uh, this year. We've heard from Luisa about Germany and her, her perspective from Germany and then around the, the globe trying to think and feel globally. Germany, of course, unprecedented floods this year. And finally now, in an important addition to our program, we have a voice from the Global South. We have Alicia Amancio from Brazil. Alicia is coordinator of the United Front for Climate Action, a campaign to bring Latin American and Caribbean people to COP. And uh, here she is, uh, Alicia, please. Hi, hi everyone. When I was invited to speak here in this panel and I was told that this would be about emotions, I decided not to prepare something because I want to speak from my heart. Um, I just have some notes here. And when I asked myself how do I feel today being from Brazil, being from the Global South and being here in the COP, this is not my first COP. I've been here since COP20, so it's been a long time that I'm in these spaces. And how do I feel? I feel, I feel furious sometimes. I feel like there is the sense of fear in the eyes of my community, of the people that come from my region. And it's sometimes people say, I have the fear of the unknown. I have the fear of you know, not knowing how the future will be for me. And I have the fear of the things that I know. I know how the future will impact my region. I know how it will be the future for black people, for indigenous people, for people of color in Brazil and all over South America and the Caribbean. Um, the climate breakdown is already happening in our regions. It's not about the future. It's right now, it's happening in this very moment. So I think it's really strange when people are talking about the future, about the future. Look at us. We are here. It's happening now and we need help. We need to work together. And. Sometimes there is not even time to feel, and I think um, the, peop the people, some people from, from my region will understand that. There is no time to feel because we are busy fighting all the time. We are busy fighting for our own survival. I do see skin, I do see skin color when I look at people. Look around, let's, let's make an exercise. Let's look around right now in this group and see how many people of color are here. 
how many indigenous youth are present here right now. I can count a few, and those few that are here, they are from the project that I, I helped coordinating. Um, and this is an exercise that I always do when I enter a space, to see how many black people, how many indigenous people are there occupying. So we need to make this a space universal for everyone. I feel frustrated in attending a COP and facing still so many barriers. I felt frustrated in my first COP, my, my voice was never taken into account, not only by the world leaders, because, well, this is what it happens, but by Global North youth who disregard us in all possible ways. It's frustrating, it's frustrating, it's frustrating. It should be time for all of us to come together as young people and as a society, but we are not together here right now. Action is coming, and I do see solidarity more present, but we need to unite. We need to unite, and how do we do that? I think that right now we need to see ourselves for who we are. We need to value our cultures. We need to value where we come from, and we need to be inclusive. This year, I coordinated a project called Unite for Climate Action, we raised funds, we got badges to bring 17 young people from the Latin American and the Caribbean to COP. Most of them BIPOC, black, indigenous, and people of color. They are here today, and the challenge only started. The moment they arrived here, the challenge had only started for them because this conference brings us so many barriers. First of all, the language barrier. The only ones that have access to these spaces, to these speaking spaces, are the people who can speak English, which is not a reality in my region, in my country. So we brought with our team, we brought two interpreters from Spanish to English because we want to be inclusive. I do think that in these spaces, like interpretation is a basic need and no one talks about it. I feel frustrated, as you can see. One of my colleagues said that she doesn't think she can do it anymore. And all I can think about is that for some of us, this, is not, this was never a choice. We have to do it. We have to keep moving. And climate justice is way more than just empty words. At least for me, it's not a chant. Climate justice is racial justice. Climate justice is gender justice. Climate justice is a reparation for the period that our continents were colonized. And climate justice means equal opportunities to all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alicia. I think you could hear some real resonance in the room there for those really important remarks that, again, some of them may have been hard to hear, but we need to hear them. So this amazing team here, you've got just about three minutes to exchange anything quick you want to exchange with each other for the benefit of those in the room and those watching all around the world via the, the UN. Who wants to jump in? I can start. I would like to make a call for action for everybody here, for the girls, for all of us, that um, it's not only important to listen to marginalized voices, it's important to pass the, mi the mic and give opportunities. Um, because we don't have those many opportunities to be in speaking roles like we are today. So whenever we can, let's pass the opportunities. Let's include, in include more people. And I do think that even though we come from different places, we share so much in common. We have this passion, we have these feelings that here at COP, they become so much more present. So um, let's work together, let's be united. But at the same time, we need to be inclusive we need to step back and put indigenous people, people of color in these spaces. It cannot be a quota of one, it needs to be 50% minimum of us in these spaces, thank you. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I feel as if intergenerational, intersectional conversations like these are so important because they can also catalyze change in ways that we might have never seen before and grow our perspectives as well. And in this realm, we can also utilize creativity. We can utilize the arts, research. We can be interdisciplinary in the way that we approach these issues. And it goes back to solidarity and being able to unite in a way. And unite not only as people, but throughout our ideas and 
throughout in terms of collectivizing what we've learned and through our lived experiences as those are a form of expertise as well in order to add that to what we know and the facts as well. Thank you. Also, please join the climate strike on Friday. <laughs> join Extinction Rebellion. <laughs> Do real action for people that need. Join the Human Impacts Institute Youth Advisory Council. <laughs> Tell us about it in one minute, uh, one sentence. <laughs> So the Youth Advisory Council combines art and research in order to create projects for young people and for climate voices across the country and across the globe. And applications are due by November 15th if you want to apply. <laughs> well, look, thank you so, so much. I gave this event very high billing, right? I said this would be one of the most extraordinary things you encountered at COP. I think I wasn't wrong. And finally, I'd like to say that these are clearly four very remarkable young people, but they are also just as some of the contributions you heard are made clear, the tip of a much larger, extraordinary iceberg. Thank them very much, thank you very much, and let's end in the customary way by thanking once again these four remarkable youth activists.